friends, welcome to the St. Michael's stream. My name is Father Charles and I'm the vicar here. This is our intentionally short online service. I am grateful the Lord has brought you here today. Today we are asking ourselves, is being a Christian actually worth it? It does take a real commitment of time, energy, and money to follow Jesus. And there are loads of other great things to do with your time and energy and money. I think it is worth it in the end because it helps me to have a better life now and prepares me to live a better life in the future when Jesus comes again. As always, like, share, subscribe, comment. If our ministry is a blessing to you, please consider a financial contribution to support our ongoing work. Now to our main question. Is going to church worth it? It is sort of a super inconvenient thing to do if we're honest. Why must it always happen so early in the morning? Like, who needs another morning of getting up early during the week? Who needs the constant guilt trip the pastor is going to try to lay on you? I try not to ever do that. Oh, the, but the congregation needs more money. The congregation needs more volunteers. And don't you want to be faithful? Here, the statement behind the statement is, don't you want to purchase God's and the pastor's favor? Well, the last thing I need more of in my life is a guilt trip about things that I should or ought or need to do. Trust me, I already know about all the things that I should and ought and need to be doing that I'm already failing at. I should be more fit. I should manage my time better. I should be more generous with my money. I should be volunteering more. I should be a bit more joyful. Boy, does that one stink. I should eat more healthfully. And I need and ought to do all these things. My guess is that you too have a pile of things that you ought to be doing, that you should be doing, that you need to do. Now, your list may look like mine. It might be different. But there is always a list. I'm also willing to bet that the last thing you need more of in your life is a fully booked guilt trip about should do's and need to's. Am I right? See, following Jesus and going to church, that is putting our faith into practice, should not just be a list of things that we ought to or need to do. And if it is, it's totally not worth it. Ain't no one got time for that, me included. Now, in our gospel reading for this morning, we see a rich ruler approach Jesus. We're in Luke chapter 18, starting at verse 18. The rich ruler approaches Jesus and asks him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, I pause here to note that whenever someone comes with such a kind greeting that is just a bit too nice and laid on perhaps a bit too thickly, I am immediately suspicious of their intentions. Likewise, you should be suspicious about the rich ruler who is approaching Jesus and be mindful of the question behind the question. The rich ruler asks, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? But what is he actually asking Jesus? He is asking a natural question, how do I inherit eternal life? But implied in his question is the real question he is asking, what must I do? Now, the question asks, how do I get the Father's love and grace? The rich ruler, though, misunderstands God's nature and the nature of love and grace. An inheritance is not something that you earn through your own merit or action. It is a gift of wealth or status or place that is utterly unearned. There is no merit involved in getting an inheritance. It is an act of pure grace and love on the part of the person leaving you the inheritance. Our Father who is in heaven created us to dwell in the kingdom of God, and he loves us. The whole story of the Bible is about our Father loving and choosing creation, even when it means literally dying for them. We don't do anything to earn the inheritance our Father has set aside for us. Relationship with our Father and following Jesus 
is not about a list of should or ought or need to do things, but it is about mutual affection and love. Our Father first loves us and chooses us, and in turn we respond to that beautiful and perfect love with love. It's like when a newborn baby is born. The parents love the child immediately, and they love and care for the child. The child, in time, develops a capacity to respond in love to the parents. But it's the mom and dad who first love the child, and they teach the child how to love. But the rich ruler does not get this. He thinks inheriting eternal life is something he can purchase. And why wouldn't he? His whole life has probably been centered around the acquisition of wealth. And the Greek here, when it talks about him being wealthy or rich, is not a metaphorical sort of wealth, but cash money. So the question behind the question is related to his wealth, his relationship with people, and his relationship with our Father. What he asks, what I, do I have to do to inherit eternal life, what he's actually saying is, how can I purchase this? How do I earn it? It's like asking someone at Target for a price check. What's it going to cost? And on the balance, is this thing worth it? Jesus understands the question behind the question and answers both the stated and the real questions. Jesus' response to the question is a question that is meant to make the rich ruler take an inventory of his stuff and his life and how he relates to people. Jesus asks, you know the commandments. Now, turn in your Bible to Exodus 20, but keep your finger here at Luke 18. We're going to look at the two lists of commandments and see if Jesus and the rich ruler get them right. Just in case the man has forgotten them, Jesus begins lifting them off. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not murder. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and your mother. It sounds like the Ten Commandments, right? Except Jesus is omitting fully half of the Ten Commandments. What's more, Jesus lists them in a peculiar inverted order. Which ones did Jesus forget? Go ahead. I'll give you a minute. Pause the video. Check Exodus 20. Jesus focuses on the second half of the Ten Commandments, which are the ones dealing with people. The second half, really the last six of the Ten Commandments, are about how we deal with people because the way we deal with people is a sacramental an act, an outward and visible sign of how we receive God's grace and deal with our Father. If you love and honor God, well, then you must love and honor others and keep the last six of the Ten Commandments. The two are related. Loving God entails loving and caring for those God loves. And so the rich ruler replies, I have kept all of these since I was a boy. Now, I imagine the ruler must feel kind of like I do when I go to my favorite coffee shop, Enda Coffee in Cottontown, and unbeknownst to me, I have already earned a free coffee that I can redeem. There is unexpected joy, a celebration, that already through my own efforts, and with absolutely nothing else required, I've done it. I've earned that free coffee, and there is nothing else to do but enjoy what a glorious day that is. And what a glorious day this rich ruler must have been having. But Jesus intervenes in the midst of his joy. There is still one missing commandment. Did you catch which of the last six Jesus had not asked the rich ruler about yet? Covetousness. That is the commandment that the rich ruler has not kept. Jesus said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give it to the poor, 
and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. And the rich ruler became very sad because he was very wealthy. Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for the rich to enter into the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter to the God kingdom of God. Now, the combination of this exchange is crucial to understanding the nature of Jesus' teacher and why the ruler leaves sad. Jesus' response is asking, what is it that the rich ruler prefers? What does he want? Will this man prefer what earth can give him or what heaven offers? It is not a test of works or a list of things the man ought to or should or needs to do, but it is a probing of his heart, an examination of his fundamental allegiances. Jesus is asking, in effect, are you covetous? And is your security in God's call or in your possessions? Now, Jesus has already taught in Luke 16, 13, that you cannot serve both God and money. In sum, Jesus wants to know if his faith, if our faith, is in the things of the earth or in the ways of God. Now, growing up, I always hear this parable taught with an eye towards a gate into Jerusalem called the Eye of the Needle Gate. That is a small gate that was difficult to pass through as a security measure for the city's protection. And if you wanted to get your camel through the gate, you would have to unload yourself and everything else from the camel and sort of shimmy the stuff and the camel through the gate separately. The point being that it is really difficult to get the camel through the eye of the needle. But just keep pushing and trying and you can do it. This is not what Jesus is talking about here. There is no good archaeological evidence for such a gate called the Eye of the Needle existing, despite loads of archaeological evidence in and around the biblical city of Jerusalem of everything else. Furthermore, look what Jesus says just after this. The people exclaim, Who can get into the kingdom of God then? And Jesus tells them that with human effort and skill, it is impossible but it is possible with God. And then the disciples, with the ever-ready Peter at the forefront, take up the argument with Jesus. Fear is driving them. Peter says in what I imagined is a terrified and exasperated tone, but Lord, we have left all to follow you. He's really asking, is this going to be worth it? See, even the disciples who had spent all this time daily with Jesus over most of his earthly ministry at this point, nearly three years of round the clock, are struggling with the is this worth it question. And is this whole follow on Jesus thing just a list of should do's and need to's? Jesus responds by reassuring them that anyone who leaves home and wife, children, or the family for the sake of the kingdom of God will receive much more in this life, in the family of God, and eternal life in the age to come. But they are not earning these things, but have instead been transformed by their encounters with Jesus each and every day into citizens of heaven. They have been transformed into the kind of people that do not have a list of should-dos or need-tos for the sake of the kingdom of heaven, but into people who want to do for the kingdom. You see, Christians become sojourners and exiles from this world, as Peter reminds us in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. Because encountering Jesus in one another and in the world and the scriptures and in our prayers over and over and over again has slowly but surely turned us into citizens of heaven. And such citizenship, Paul in Philippians 3, 20 and following, means that the things of the earth now grow strangely dim in light for us. And our glorious and gracious relationship with God grows larger. Our resources cease to be our own. They become the tools of heaven in order to serve God. And only as we get a sense of detachment from the things of earth can we then give our life to God as we are given the grace to covet the things of heaven and not the things of earth. Living this way means being thoughtful about who and what you surround yourself with. 
It means finding a group of people that are themselves citizens of heaven and living this way together. A discipleship group here at St. Michael's. We've got some online and in-person ones. So let us know if you want to join because it can be a great way to do that. When you are with others who are citizens of heaven, the list of should do's and need to's you hear when reading scripture or praying or going to church gets smaller and smaller and smaller over time until there are no more should do's and need to's left. They are replaced with want to's and I get to's. Is the church and the Christian life worth it? Well, it takes time to be transformed into a citizen of heaven for that list of should and need tos to become fully want tos. And truth be told, it does take your time. It does take your money. It does take effort. Truth be told, it does mean changing the way you live and the people with whom you spend your time. Truth be told, it means giving up your citizenship here and becoming a citizen of heaven. Is it worth it? I suppose it depends upon what you want. But I do know that the people I've met and known who end up in life with joy and filled with happiness and meaning in their lives have all had one thing in common. They've been serious citizens of heaven. You have to decide for yourself is it worth it? Do you want to live this way or not? I can't answer that for you. Your spouse, your friends can't answer that for you. Your parents can't answer that for you. That is a you question. It's between you and the Lord. I hope that you will want to and you will join us as we walk to heaven together. <laughs>